Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Matthias. I'd like to thank the organizers, first of all, Alan, uh, Matthias, uh, Walter, uh, Victor, and Raima for organizing the whole thing. I mean, it's been going on for three months and a half. Uh, well, and then I, I, I calculated we had about a minimum 100 hours of talks, right? I mean, 100, 120 hours of talks. So it, it was really, it was, oh, yeah, 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 not, not, not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I attended, I would say, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to brag and say that I attended almost all of them. So maybe five of them I missed for some reasons, but okay. So it was really great, great to be here. So um, thanks again for the invitation. Okay, so um, this is not about the curvature of the non commutative torus. It's, it's a different subject, but of course it started from there. Uh, it's a curvature of the terminal line bundle for over, the, uh, over moduli spaces of uh, connections or <coughs> DR operators on non commutative tori. Okay, so the whole thing is, is kind of centered around the idea of determinant. So determinant is, 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 is the central concept for this talk. And uh, what, what better way to start a cold Monday morning warming up with the uh, idea of maybe determinant. So what is determinant? Okay, so, um, so um, I want to talk about a little bit just about zeta regularized determinants. Uh, maybe I'll start with a question. So imagine you have a sequence of numbers that's uh, going to infinity, and you can imagine these numbers typically are going to be a spectrum of some uh, Laplacians and some compact manifold. This is the typical situation. They go to infinity, and you ask yourself, what is the product of all these numbers that would be the determinant of your operator? So, of course, you can say this is a crazy question, right, because the, 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 the product is obviously infinite, but we are not interested in infinite. We want to get a finite number out of this. There are different ways to do that, and they give different results, actually. All of them are interesting, a relation between them and this thing is a very, very interesting subject. And amazingly, they are extremely useful, as we'll see uh, in several occasions. So uh, one way is to, to use uh, zeta functions, to associate the zeta function to the sequence. And then, by some uh, formal manipulation, define the value of your determinant. So this is the uh, spectral zeta function. You just, you just need these numbers to define it formally. And then you have to assume that this function is convergent for real part of S large enough has meromorphic extension to C and is regular at zero. So these are assumptions on the sequence, on the growth of the sequence that you want to, to assume. Uh, in, in examples, uh, coming from compact manifold, this is de definitely the case, compact without boundary, certainly, and without singularity, this is definitely the case. And then, okay, so you have the uh, you have, uh, value of the function at zero, zeta at zero, and it's derivative at zero, and uh, it just, uh, this definition, is a perfectly uh, good definition. So you define product of lambda i to be this finite number, exponential of minus derivative of zeta at zero. This is justified, for example, if you have finite number of these numbers, and also justified if you do a formal computation. By some formal computation, this is justified. And that's what is used in physics, also in mathematics. It was introduced by Ray, Ray Singer in the study of analytic torsion, and then it's, um, it's, it's used uh, in many, many places. So this is a very good concept. I'm going, to I'm, going to, I'm going to be working with this later on quite a bit. But uh, just for the moment, let me just uh, uh, give maybe one example, just, uh, just a cute example just uh, to, to have in mind. So imagine you want to define products of all numbers 1, 2, 3 up to infinity. So you ask. You give this question to your calculus uh, students and ask them, what is, prod what is infinite factorial? Uh, this is kind of a cute question. And you tell them infinite factorial is equal to root 2 pi. OK. So the calculation is justified by knowing the value of derivative of Riemann's zeta function as 0. This is a standard result. It's minus log root 2 pi. And you feed in into previous formula, you get this number. So that's a. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, I mean, another thing is that these numbers in general, these zeta values, derivatives of zeta, the special places are hardly known. I mean, there are very, very few explicit calculations for these things are known. But uh, amazingly, we don't need uh, many explicit calculations. Now, the point is this. Imagine you have the Laplacian, which is d star d in, in, in for first order operators, Dirac operators. 
Now, this assignment of determinant the d to a square root of determinant of d star d, if this would be kind of your determinant, this is not a holomorphic function, right? This cannot be holomorphic because this is a real valued function. So it cannot be holomorphic in any sense. If, if you perturb d in some holomorphic family, this is not going to perturb, to, to change in a holomorphic manner. And there was a, there is an important question, how to define a holomorphic regularized determinant? That's, that's an important question, even in physics. This is related to holomorphic anomalies and um, conformal field theory. So this question was important early 1980s already. And uh, it's much harder to cook up this kind of canonical holomorphic determinants. Uh, one approach, is, uh, <coughs> this, was, this is due to Quillen, and I'm going to fo follow that. I'm going to kind of take that idea and transplant it in the non-commutative world with some extra work, which works, is Quillen's approach. So Quillen wrote a very, uh, very important formula, uh, paper in 1985. It's um, called uh, Determinant of Cauchy Riemann Operators uh, on, uh, for Riemann Surfaces. In this paper, he did many things. Uh, it's only three pages and a half, by the way. So that's a good, good <laughs> style of writing papers. One of the things he introduced was uh, the terminal line bundle. The other one was curvature of the terminal line bundle. And he showed that if you can calculate the curvature, to get the right formula, then there is a way to correct the, cur the connection so that you get a flat connection and you get uh, something which is holomorphic determinant. So I'll explain a little bit of that later. But this is the idea. But um, OK, so that was a kind of ad advertisement for what's, what's going to come eventually in my talk. So, but let me go back now to the beginnings and start where all these things started. So for us, of course, it was non-commutative torus and my work with Farzad. So I'm going to go back to that. I'll tell you a little bit of uh, curvature uh, calculations for non commutative tori, and uh, maybe also fix the notation and uh, give you uh, some, some background material that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need later. Uh, OK, so now the thing that I want to emphasize here is that it is curved, OK? So this is future, OK, if, uh, for Mathieu. Curved is about future. Because tori that we have been looking so far before uh, this series of works was really not a curved tori. The curve was a topological object, was a smooth object, right? non commutative torus that we looked at was always a topological, a homotopical, a smooth kind of object. We never looked at it before this series of works on curvature as a curved object. This kind of work that we did uh, uh, following uh, Alain's work. I mean, it's really um, first instances of curved, uh, curved in the sense of Riemannian geometry of uh, non-commutative manifolds. So yes, indeed, this is about future. So get as much as, define as much as curvy objects in NCG as you want and work and do these calculations for them. I think that's a very good area to invest on <coughs> and to put your money on. OK, so um, yeah, let's try. <laughs> I, I'm talking to some other people now. <laughs> sure. So now let's look at non-commutative torus as, um, oh, by the way, I can also say that um, we always say non-commutative geometry, right, NCG. So this is the G in NCG. This is the geometry of NCG, really. <laughs> Not the topology, not K theory, not KK theory. This is the geometry of NCG. OK, so now anyhow, so let's look at uh, the non-commutative torus. Uh, well, you know the definition is universal C star algebra generated by unitaries U and V that satisfy this relation. There is this C star algebra. And there is a smooth uh, kind of, there's a dense subalgebra of this algebra. You can define it in different ways. Here is, for example, you can define it explicitly in terms of <coughs> charge class sequences. The sums of sequences like that, which are rapidly decreasing, um, we can also define it as space of smooth vectors for action of R2 on the non-commutative torus. All these things give you the same result. And this algebra is pretty good. This is, this is a replacement of smooth functions on the non-commutative torus. And this um, is something you can do. Um, I mean, we know that it is closed under holomorphic functional calculus, so this is a good object. 
Okay, so I jumped too much. Now, a little bit of um, <coughs> differential operators, so differential calculus, I would say. You can do on this initially, and that was done by, uh, by Kahn at the um, beginning of 1980s in his first paper. You have this uh, differential operators, delta 1 and delta 2, which are derivations uniquely defined by these formulas. And there is integration. So my notation is I use phi 0. I don't, I don't use tau for the canonical frame. I just use phi 0. So on the smooth elements can be defined like that. And now maybe this is a bit new, complex structures. Well, it's been around for some time, but not in this vein of work. Anyhow, so the complex structures, you can fix it by fixing a complex parameter in the upper half plane, exactly like the elliptic curve, case of elliptic curve. So you fix that. And you, you can say a lot of things about the meaning of complex structures. I don't want to get into that. But uh, for us, for the moment, it really boils down to definition of a differential operator, which would be the analog of the Dolbo operator. And it's adjoint. Okay? So we just take that. So this is Dolbo. Well, actually, it's the del bar. But the, in the papers, we, we denote it by del. Okay, following Kahn's, uh, Kahn and Tetko paper. So this del is delta 1 plus tau delta 2, and its formal adjoint is delta 1 plus tau bar delta 2 in, in, in some precise sense. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it soon. So we have this stuff, kind of differential calculus, a little bit of complex structure on this non-commutative elliptic curve now, you can just uh, say. Now the first thing about uh, um, putting some curvier structure on non curvy torus came from an old paper of uh, Kahn and Tretkov. Uh, so they started this stuff, uh, and then they waited for 18 years to finish the paper. So then they finished the paper uh, four or five years ago, and then we started working on that. So the, the, the paper, um, in, the, in the paper, uh, Kahn and Tretkov, they introduced uh, a, a conformal factor. So this conformal factor, H, is an element of uh, smooth non curvy torus. It's not a constant. It's not a constant. And you use this conformal factor uh, to perturb the volume form by this formula. So you perturb the original trace phi 0 by this amount. So this is like you have introduced now a really uh, a kind of new volume form. It changes point to point on your non commutative space. So this is already idea of uh, change that it's point-wise dependent in some sense. Now, just for uh, notations that I'm going to use, this is uh, not a trace. This is a twisted trace. And easily, you can see that it satisfies this KMS condition, phi of AB equal to phi of B delta <coughs> bold face delta of A, which is the uh, inner uh, automorphism defined by E to the A. So this bold face is not Laplacian. Uh, OK, so we have to be careful not to confuse it with Laplacian later on, but this is bold. OK, so then uh, you Using this um, new volume form, you perturb the, um, your Dolbo operator to something called del phi. And this is delta 1 plus tau delta 2, which is the adjoint. Which is, it's the same thing, but the adjoint of this operator. This, this, this is a space of 1, 0 form. You can think of h again. Uh, that's not a problem. And this h phi is GNS construction, of course. So you take the formal adjoint of del phi with respect to this new metric that you put here. And then you get some operator which can be completely unwieldy. I mean, this operator is com can be completely crazy and could be very, very general. Um, I mean, uh, Dirac operator on the torus. OK. So th and this is your perturbed non-flat Laplacian or curvy Laplacian <laughs> that you want to work with. OK, then the question uh, that's uh, kind of very important is uh, computing a scalar curvature for this geometric object, non-commuted geometric object. Now, um, how can you define a scalar curvature for these things? So the first thing you notice is that algebraic formalism breaks down completely in general. There, although, I mean, Riemannian geometry, we have algebraic formalism. But in this case, there is no algebraic formalism because there is no connection. You have this Riemannian metric, but you don't have a connection. But the spectral geometry um, tells us, actually, shows us a way of defining a scalar curvature in general. I mean, I wrote it for the non commutative torus, but this is true for all spectral triples. 
And this was, uh, this is, this plays a very, very important role in non-commutative geometry, of course. These are spectral ideas that are imported from classical Riemannian geometry to this world and gives us, so in some sense, their hard theorems are our definitions, in some sense. But then you have to work with these definitions and then to grind some numbers, and that's the hard work. So the scalar curvature of this curved non commutative torus, you can say, is a unique element uh, in the smooth non commutative torus, satisfying this equation. Trace of A, Laplacian to the power minus S, at S equal to 0, trace of AP by 0 of AR. This should be, this is an equation should be satisfied for all A, all the smooth elements A. This P is the projection onto the kernel of Laplacian. So it looks like crazy. How can you work with such a thing? In practice, you work with these things and you try to find this number by explicit formulas if you know the kernel of this operator e to this uh, exponential of minus uh, Laplacian. And you compute the kernel using constant differential calculus. I don't want to go into details. There have been talks here. I mean, this, there are many papers that are written about this thing. So let me just see one of the main results which was obtained. So this result was um, this formula for scalar curvature, uh, which was obtained by Khan Muscovici and Farzad and myself. Uh, the formula for scalar curvature is, is like this. It's a very, very explicit formula for the non torus. It's a sum of three terms. These functions R1, R2, and W are explicit functions. You feed in uh, log delta, which is log of this modular operator. So this is essentially commutator with h. You get an operator. Apply your operator on these elements of the non commutative torus, so the result is some general element of the non commutative torus, like that. So you can see that, for example, here is a little bit of Dirichlet energy, like the classical formula you can see here. Here there is a commutator of this uh, conformal factor. Here is the anti commutator. So there is some beauty in this formula, but still we don't know uh, what's the real uh, meaning of this formula in, in, in some sense. Uh, it remains to be done, so that's something uh, for future, for sure, it has to be understood. The formulas R1, R2, or W, are, there is no way you can guess these formulas based on pure reason or by formal calculations. But these formulas are very explicit, and how can you guess these formulas without doing some hard calculations? There's, there's no way you can, you can drive these formulas. Unlike the case of Riemannian geometry, where you have your formula, for the metric in some coordinates, you plunge it into the, put it into the machine, and you get these formulas back. But nothing like that works here. So you just, and it's indeed amazing that you get formulas like this, because there are many, many terms that cancel. And after, after a while, after thousands of terms that cancel, you get something which is manageable, and it's, it's finite term. It's still, I don't, know, I don't understand why this is the case. Certainly, it has to be understood. Now, what remains to be done here? Well, we have to define new non commutative spaces, for sure. We have to define new non commutative spaces, extend these spectral computations to them. Also, we have to understand the relation between different approaches. There has been already quite a few work, and uh, they take different points of view. The last two works, Rosenberg Arlen, is more algebraic, much, much more algebraic, and we have to understand if there is any relation. I doubt it if there would be any relation eventually, unlike the classical case. That's a big difference between classical. Uh. Yeah, Jonathan, this is Jonathan. Jonathan. Yes. I hope my spelling is correct. I see, it doesn't satisfy it also? Yeah, OK. So, so there anyhow, so it created a lot of interesting questions. So there is already, I can see, some industry uh, working around these things. Uh, quite a few of us are working. As Farzad has uh, this very interesting recent paper. He has pushed these four-dimensional calculations. It simplified quite a bit. Also understood Einstein-Hilbert action quite a bit. So I think these are, uh, I also worked on a little bit of Riemann-Roch theorem. So Riemann-Roch theorem has to be has to be pushed further, it's not final. So that uh, that's, uh, that's remains to be done. So this is what uh, I wanted to spend time on, um, uh, about explaining these things. But that's not uh, what uh, the title of my talk, right? The title of my talk 
is about um, determinant of line uh, of, uh, I mean, curvature of determinant line bundle for the non classic torus. So let me now use the notation terminology on to, uh, introduced for non classic torus. Now see what we can do in this case. All right? So um, as I said, this log that, which is minus zeta prime, is not a holomorphic object. So how to define a holomorphic determinant? Uh, so that was the main question that was uh, answered by Quillen in that paper, 1985 paper. Um, it's uh, based on the terminal line bundle. OK, so let me now, OK, so basically, you can forget about what I said before, the maybe first 20 minutes of my talk, and just think about what I'm saying now. It's just fresh. So what is the terminal line bundle? The terminal line bundle is a line bundle over space of fret home operators. OK, fret home operators, of course, you have two Hilbert spaces, H0, H1. This is a space of all fret home operators. This is a very, very important space. I mean, for example, Etienne Yenig has this result, that all result, that this is a classifying space for K theory. Sorry, this K0 should be up. This is classifying space for K theory. Uh, however, there is no. Um, kind of vector bundle, natural vector bundle. They didn't know any natural vector bundle over this space. So that if you pull back these bundles, then you create all these vector bundles, virtual bundles over x, so that you can. I mean, this result is a homotopy theory result. It's not a vector bundle type result. But amazingly, there is a line bundle over f, which is kind of determinant of this virtual, otherwise non-existing bundle, which is the determinant bundle of this virtual vector bundle, which is the index bundle. So let me introduce that. So I need a notation. This, uh, let me uh, denote by lambda, which is lambda max. This is the top exterior power functor. So this top exterior power functor, if you have a finite dimensional vector space, you raise it, you take exterior power with itself uh, as many times as dimension of this vector space, right? So this is a one dimensional space always. So that's the notation. Um, now, uh, the result uh, of Quillen, uh, the first part is that there is a holomorphic line bundle determinant over f such that its fiber over any elliptic operator is given by exterior power of, uh, top exterior power of kernel of the operator, which is finite dimensional because the guy is, is fret home, tensor, exterior power of kernel of T star. Uh, you can think of this as co kernel of T. So this whole object you can think of as determinant line of index bundle, which would be kernel of T minus co-kernel of T, right? But notice that kernel of T is not a vector bundle because there are jumps in uh, dimensions. And co-kernel of T is also not a vector bundle. So this is a highly, highly non-trivial result. It's not easy to prove this result at all. I mean, this is the fact that such thing exists is, to me, is just still is amazing. That you have the non-existent kind of virtual bundle. Its determinant still exists and uh, can be defined. Is the dual? Is the adjoint of the operator? Is the adjoint of? Is, is oh yes, the first star. Yes, good. The first star is the dual of this vector space. Is a one-dimensional vector space. You take its formal dual. Yeah. I mean vector space dual. Yeah, there are different duals. Yeah. The second thing is that there is a section over a space of fret home operators of index 0. So if F0 is the space of fret home operators of index 0, now imagine if T is invertible, this line bundle becomes something very, very simple, right? If T is invertible, then this line bundle, then <laughs> this is, is a copy of C. It's not even <coughs> one dimensional. You can say it is complex numbers. There's no isomorphism needed. It's already complex numbers, right? So this map, sigma t, which is 1 if t is invertible and 0 otherwise, is a holomorphic section of determinant over f0. OK, so f0 is the place you want to be. Because th the reason you want to define this holomorphic determinant is that you want to say whether this operator is invertible or not. So you, you want to be over space of operators that have index at least 0. If, if operator doesn't have index 0, you don't, the, the question of its uh, invertibility is a non-question because we know that it's not invertible, right? So you, you, you want to be over F0. OK. So both results are, are quite interesting results. They're general results. These, these are results about, I mean, really, operator theory, fret operators. 
it is. It is even holomorphic. Oh, yeah. No, it is. It is. It is even holomorphic. Yeah. No, you one, uh, one, yeah. Uh, you know, it is, it is even holomorphic. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, let me introduce these Cauchy Riemann operators on a theta. So these Cauchy Riemann operators or <laughs> Dirac operators on a theta, for me uh, in this lecture, is going to be an operator which is a perturbation of this Dolbo operator there bar by some amount alpha. But alpha is, is an element of non consistorial right? So I mean, for this talk, we just take, I mean, this paper, we just, we ju we just took um, this sort of perturbations of the uh, standard Dolbo operator, right? So if you want, this is some kind of spectral triple. And this is, so this A is a space of all elliptic, uh, space of operators D uh, of the form del bar plus alpha. Now, what you do then, you pull back. OK, we know that these operators are elliptic. I mean, by you can use constant differential calculus or other methods. You can show that these operators are elliptic. So what happens is that you get a map from A into a space of perturbative operators. Right? You're just sending D to the elliptic operators that's defined by D. Right? And then you pull back the terminal line over A by D. So this way, you define a holomorphic line bundle LD over this space A, moduli space of your operators uh, in this case, Cauchy Riemann operators in this case. Its kernel, by definition, is exterior power of kernel of T tensor exterior power of kernel of uh, co kernel of T or kernel of T star. So, okay, so now you have this line bundle, which is pullback of this uh, Quillen's determinant line bundle. And uh, <coughs> so what's, what's so good about this line bundle? <coughs> you have this section sigma, right? We ha I wrote down this section sigma. <coughs> now, the way uh, to use this line bundle, the strategy to use the line bundle to define a holomorphic determinant was this. If L admits a canonical global holomorphic frame S over some section, Imagine your line bundle has some kind of holomorphic frame S, right? Then what can you do? You have this holomorphic section sigma. You have this frame S, and this is just a line bundle, right? So you can express the frame, the, 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 this sigma D, in terms of S. This is and then you get a number, right? You get a number. And this number, the terminus of D, is going to be holomorphic because everything is holomorphic. So this would be the definition of holomorphic determinant. So the thing works if you can produce this uh, holomorphic frame S, right? If you can produce the holomorphic frame S, then certainly you have, uh, certainly you have defined your uh, holomorphic determinant. That was the strategy um, to define this holomorphic determinant. Now, how can we define a canonical frame um, for this holomorphic uh, line bundle. The idea was that you define a connection which is flat, a holomorphic connection or del bar connection which is flat. And then because it's flat, if you fix a point, then you can do parallel transport. You get a global holomorphic frame for your bundle by monodromy, by parallel transport. You, you, you get that, and then you have uh, this uh, frame, holomorphic frame S. So if you can prove that your line bundle has a canonical flat holomorphic connection, then you're done. The classical case and this case as well. So that was the strategy. That's the strategy. Sorry? Global, because, I mean, A is, your space A is, is an affine space. So it's contractible. The question is canonicality, to define something which is canonical. We know that this exists. And there are many, many choices. But there is a canonical choice. You want to you put your hand on that canonical choice. So how can you produce a flat connection on your uh, determined line bundle, in this case and in general? So here is the second big idea 
uh, in Quillen's paper is that he used uh, this, uh, this <coughs> infinite dimensional regularized determinants to define a metric on the space of, on this line bundle of uh, uh, form over, over the space of form operators. So this is a famous uh, Quillen's metric. <coughs> so in, in, in our case also works the same. So let's restrict over the space where index of the operator is zero, index zero operator over, over F zero. So if you are over F zero, or, or if you just work with cauchy riemann or Dirac operator that have index zero, then you have that section for your um, line bundle, and you declare norm of sigma, the equivalent norm of sigma squared, to be exactly determinant of delta which is exponential of minus zeta prime at zero. So delta is discarded. That's, uh, this is the <coughs> Laplace thing. So you have defined this number. And now the beautiful fact is that this is a smooth Hermitian metric on L. Being Hermitian is not a problem. You have defined a norm. But being smooth is, is a big deal. To define that this is smooth is not obvious. But you can define that this is smooth. You can prove that this is smooth, indeed. So this is a smooth Hermitian metric on L. Now, if you have a smooth Hermitian metric on, on, on kind of holomorphic vector bundle, then there is a compatible holomorphic connection on your Hermitian vector bundle if you are over a complex manifold. We know that there is, there is this compatible structure connection. right? So you can use that general result and say that, OK, then as a result, you have defined a holomorphic connection on your vector bundle. This is the unique holomorphic connection, which is compatible with this Hermitian structure. Right? So that's, that's the idea. As I said, a Hermitian metric on a holomorphic line bundle has a unique compatible connection. So here, a compatibility is, is with respect to two things. First of all, it preserves the Hermitian structure. And second of all, it's a Del Bar connection. Right? There's, there's two compatibility with complex structure and compatibility with uh, L bar thing, right? Now, because this is a line bundle, this is not a general vector bundle, there's a very nice formula for its curvature. There's a very, very nice formula for its curvature. The curvature is given by this del bar del. These are cauchy riemann uh, operators, classic cauchy riemann operators. Log norm of S squared. So where S is any local holomorphic frame. So pick any local holomorphic frame, and this number is going to uh, be the curvature of the thing. Sorry? Well, I mean, I'm talking about general thing. I, I'm going to use that, actually. Okay. I'm going to use that soon. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the thing is, you might say, OK, if you do the computation, you're going to get 0. And then, OK, you have produced a flat connection. This is not the case. <laughs> this is not going to be your final flat connection. But the computation of its curvature is very important. Once you know the curvature, then you can correct this connection that you obtained here by a certain amount to get a flat connection. And then well, using flat connection, you, you produce the <coughs> thing. So, so it goes into several steps. So um, this is the very classic formula, del bar del, as I said, log norm of s squared. So do this. OK, so. Um, now, the, the thing is, how can we compute this term in our case? Uh, the computation of these curvature terms um, in, in the non-computed case, already in, in the case of non-computed torus and in other examples, heavily relies on uh, cons to the differential calculus. So let me just quickly remind you about cons to the differential calculus. But what is important in this case is that this to the differential calculus was not enough. Okay. So in the case that uh, we worked before for, for the torus, we used to the differential calculus as it was to carry the calculation. But in this case, this is not enough. You have to extend the pseudo differential calculus to logarithmic uh, differential operators. This is the idea that was introduced actually in classically by Matthias, I think. And we used that. And then we also extended this konsevich vishik trace on this stuff. And once you have that, then you have a chance of uh, doing the computations uh, in this way. So let me tell you a little bit of uh, 
this line now. So, this is the differential calculus. Um, the symbols are like kind of global to the differential operators on, on tori. Symbols are smooth functions R2 into your uh, smooth torus, non-contact torus, and they satisfy some uh, estimate at infinity um, if they are going to be of order m. And if you know the space of symbols of order m by Sm. And as usual, you can attach a, to a symbol of order m a differential operator or pseudo differential operator p sigma. You do Fourier transform, you do some kind of infer, inverse Fourier transform. In between, you multiply by symbol, and that's your pseudo differential operator. So that's like uh, the classical case. Um, with some care and being aware of non commutativity involved everywhere, you can carry out. And this is an operator you define a theta to a theta. This is pseudo differential operator for order m. This was introduced by Kahn by the way, in 1980. So this is a classic paper. Alpha denotes the action, denotes the action of R2 on, on your non contact torus. <laughs> it's kind of the, the ex exponent of the Fourier transform in one way. And, but that's the, this is the classical Fourier transform. That's the non commutative Fourier transform, if you want. One integration is non commutative. Okay, classical symbols, it's clear how to define classical symbols. So they admit a symptotic expansion of this form, the order of uh, this term as, as the homogeneity order of this guy is, is homogeneous of order alpha minus j. So if you can introduce cutoff functions, because there's a, these terms cannot be defined as zero. Unlike sigma, which is defined everywhere, these guys are not defined as zero. So to be precise, you can define cutoff functions chi sigma and for any order n, any finite order n, you have an asymptotic expansion. You have a finite expansion like that. This sigma n is of right order. So this kind of classical symbols, you approximate your operator by sums, infinite sums of homogeneous uh, terms of order alpha minus j, decreasing order. And then the notation, this is your <coughs> operator's classical symbols and corresponding classical two differential operators. OK? Now, um, one of the ideas, as I said, we had to introduce was to extend this conservative trace. So let me tell you this canonical trace or conservative trace, what's the idea? So uh, the idea is this. If you have a pseudo of order minus 2, it's trace class. This is the standard, right? Pseudo of order minus 2, because 2 is the dimension of the manifold. Less than minus dimension of manifold. This is trace class, and in fact, trace is given by integrating the symbol over the phase space and applying the change. So this double integration and this so this is kind of like in the classical case. Phi zero is the uh, trace on the non commutative torus. This is an element usual. It's usual. Yeah. So now uh, for operators of order uh, bigger than or equal to minus two, in general, what can you do? This number is infinite. But there is a way to regularize this infin infinity by taking a finite part of this expansion. So you look at <coughs> the value of this guy, when you integrate over finite uh, balls of radi radius r, and you notice how these guys are going towards infinity. Okay, so if you use, um, it's not difficult actually to show that the way they go to infinity is going to be uh, of this form. There is some polynomial dependence of high orders like that, and then there is a log term, and there is a constant term. And this expansion is unique for non-integral order operators. So the operator must be non-integral order. So if you assume that, so you have got this term, which is eventually infinite, but you know how it's going to infinity. The way it's going to infinity exactly, precisely is of this form. So this part you declare to be your trace. Now this part. The coefficient of log r, it was defined by Farzad, this is the non-commutative, non-commutative residue for the non-commutative torus. That was the case. But the term that's... Uh, okay, yeah, but I, I think... Okay, so... Yeah, so I'll address that question later. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, I think that can be addressed, yeah. But if you pick this uh, constant term, this is the finite part. This is Hadamard's finite part as our 
thing. So this is the idea of conservative specific phrase. So the cutoff integral of a symbol is defined uh, by that term, C sigma, and we denote it by this thing. And then you can define the canonical phrase or conservative specific phrase of a pseudo tensor operator of non-integral order alpha to be just that. You take this, apply trace, you get a number. This is exact analog of uh, conservative specific phrase. So there is a way of uh, defining non-commutative residue in terms of TR. So this formula holds. I mean, this guy, in some sense, is a holomorphic extension of uh, a non-commutative residue, if you want. Um, this formula is quite crucial for us. And in fact, in this case, this formula holds. So you can take residue of A to be residue in the usual sense of conservative phrase of this microlocalization of A Q to the power minus T. So this, this relation is quite, quite crucial. True. Now here is the idea of uh, log symbols. As I said, this is the idea due to, I think, Matthias, uh, uh, Matthias Lesch. And uh, the, the, the idea is that log really, I mean, you want to, to, to have your log, log of Q, for example, log of Laplacian, log of elliptic, positive elliptic operators, to be pseudo differential operators that you want to work with. We need that. These are not usual pseudos, right? So you extend the class of pseudos by introducing a larger class of symbols. This is, these are log polyhomogeneous symbols. These guys are polyhomogeneous uh, terms, or well, homogeneous terms. And this, uh, there is a, there's, you postulate an asymptotic expansion like that. A good thing for this, as I said, is that, for example, you can show log Q, where Q is um, positive elliptic to the operator of order Q positive is a logarithmic uh, symbol and a logarithmic uh, pseudo. OK, so and you can also extend uh, this uh, Wojcicki residue to this thing, as uh, in the classical case. So the Wojcicki residue for this guy, you just define residue of A, but this guy, residue of A, is going to be integral sigma minus 2, 0. So you really throw away all these log parts and just pick the usual part that you, you needed to pick in that case. OK, so I think with this, we have a lot of technicalities needed to launch into the proof. You see, the proof that Quillen gave in that paper is half a page, and the proof can the Quillen's proof cannot be transplanted into, into our case because he uses green functions, he uses points, uses approximation along the diagonal, and all these techniques which are not accessible. So you have to reformulate, you have to come up with a new proof, new pseudo differential calculus. So um, the proof, as I said, we have to uh, find uh, basically a second variation of this term. So so what you do is uh, you consider a holomorphic family of cauchy riemann operators, DW, which is del bar plus alpha W. Now you allow this term alpha to change depending on a holomorphic parameter W. So W is, 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 is a parameter in the complex plane. You allow this. So if you want, you can imagine this alpha to be a map from an open subset of the complex plane into A theta. Right? So you get a holomorphic family in this sense. And you want to compute <coughs> this variation. So this variation in our case is really just delta W ball, delta W. So it's really like you are taking derivatives three times. But these two derivatives are with respect to the uh, complex parameters in the plane. This derivative is derivative with respect to S. So it's like a three times different derivative. So of course, by my definition of uh, conservative Wieschik phrase, this is just by canonical phrase, this is just dbz phase of Laplacian to the power minus z. So how can you compute this? So th th there is, all right. Okay, so I just finish quickly. So there is a there is a saying uh, that uh, no mathematical. Uh, <coughs> so, so, uh, so it's a saying that every mathematics talk uh, without a proof is like a movie without a love scene. So <laughs> I should give my love scene here. I cannot be. I cannot be very explicit. So this is the rate that <laughs> 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 unfortunately, I've been cut off. But I, 
I, but I can give a rated <laughs> version of the proof. Like <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, this is the soft version. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we want to compute second variation of log z. You need uh, several propositions. The first proposition is that you write the variation. Second variation is given by this term. This is the phrase. These are the variations of the Dirac operator, and this is the residue of log Laplacian D inverse. Now, this operator D inverse is the inverse, of course, and this is the log of the operator is like that. that we know that it's reasonable thing. So the whole thing now it boils down to computing this residue. This residue density. We have to compute the residue density. So to compute the residue density. I mean, this, this is all already is not so obvious. I mean, it needs some calculation. But the, the most difficult part is to compute the residue density where you have to get your hands really dirty. So the residue density is computed like this. The residue density of log delta d inverse, you can just write down. You just use the constant differential calculus, and then you compute. And the part that you need, which is sigma minus 2, 0, as I said, because that's the part that you need to compute the uh, canonical phrase, residue, rather, is given by this explicit uh, element in the non-commutative torus. So this is an explicit element of the non-commutative torus, residue density. And then you compute delta w bar, variation of this, you get this number. OK, so this is good. And finally, you can put everything together, and then you get a formula for second variation of log that, which is um, the formula that we were really looking for. So it, 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 it took me, I mean, it took us almost a year to come up with this formula. If, by the way, it's exact analog of Quillen's formula. I mean, for theta equal to 0, this reduces to Quillen's formula. I mean, that is expected. Uh, but uh, as I said, the proof is different. The right-hand side is some kind of symplectic structure on the space of Dirac operators. Left-hand side is this curvature term. So you can say that this curvature term is given by this sort of symplectic structure. So you can think of this determinant line bundle as the line bundle that you get by virtue of geometric quantization for this symplectic, integral symplectic form on the right-hand side. But OK, but that's uh, not uh, I, uh, what I want to talk about. I mean, uh, I'm out of time. Uh, if you give me maybe one minute, I can maybe tell you how you can use this to com produce the flat connection. So let me tell you how to use this non-flat connection. For me, yeah, tau is the complex structure, and this is imaginary part of tau. So exactly. And there is a little bit of nuance between our normalization and Quillen's normalization, but that's completely understood, and there's no, there's no problem. W is, uh, w is, yeah, it just gives you the complex parameter. Because this is an infinite dimensional space. To talk about variations, you have to fix a plane inside the infinite dimension and take the variation over there. So that's the idea. OK, so that's that. Um, just quickly, uh, you just modify your metric to get a flat connection. This is the modified metric. This is the flat metric, if you want. You modify Quillen metric by this amount. This is the norm on the space of Dirac operators. This is, there's a standard norm you can introduce. And you compute the curvature of this guy. You notice that this is 0. That's a trivial computation to compute curvature of this term. Using the same formula, you get 0. And as a result, then you get, OK, you have to fix a point d0. You have to fix a point d0. So this is an affine space. You fix a point in the affine space, and then you get the thing. And then this determinant depends on choice of d0, and then it satisfies this condition. So this is the regularized, zeta regularized determinant. This is the holomorphic determinant whose absolute value squared is given by this, uh, this formula, exactly like the class structure. I mean, there is a lot uh, that can be done after this. I mean, so we are working on that. But uh, maybe I should stop here. Thanks so much. Uh, For me? 
The flat connection is the connection that's associated to this uh, new metric, F. It is flat. It's flat. You, you, you do the computation, it's flat. Because the curvature of norm S is exactly given by a formula which they cancel each other. You can show that they cancel each other. Yes, yes. That breaks the uh, symmetry. That's the idea of conformal uh, anomaly, that you, you're, you have broken the symmetry. So then, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, explicitly, I'm not sure. Uh, yes. D minus D naught, uh, yes, is an element of the algebra. But the norm that you introduce is the symplectic norm that I, I, I had on the right-hand side of the curvature form. It's not the norm of the star algebra. Yes. I'm not sure. No, I mean, well, well, the dependence on D0 is unavoidable, but the rest of the stuff uh, is canonical, so it's complete. And that's always the case. I mean, even in the case of elliptic curves, there is a simple calculation you can do for uh, classical uh, complex uh, tori with, compli I mean, tori with complex structure. You can show that there are many different choices of these holomorphic determinants, and then uh, so there's no way to fix a holomorphic. I mean, <laughs> there are two things, which is gauge invariance versus holomorphicity, and they don't match. They don't match. <laughs> to <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. The theta, um, th 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 that's true. There is this one, but I'm not using that, that point of view here. No, this is a different. This line bundle directly comes from, uh, from, from line bundle over Fretum operator. So that's a, that's the terminal line bundle. That's very, very different. I mean, so. But sure, yeah, that comes from uh, structure. Yes. Yes. This, I just choose a two-dimensional subspace by this map alpha that, that goes from this complex plane in here. Because that's also the, that's the case in Quillen's paper as well. I mean, because you want to talk about del bar operators and all these things in this affine complex manifold. So you have to do that. Yes. The first part of the lecture, yes. Yes. This is the density. I think it's the density. Yes, yes, yes. OK, so there is a, there is a bit of, uh, yeah, yeah, there's this density, yeah. Because in uh, Gilkey's formula also, they always come with density. Yeah. Yeah, this I haven't, under, I haven't uh, looked at. Um, my, my next plan is to go into, of course, I mean, it's a very obvious thing to, to introduce, uh, I mean, really projective modules, because that's the case you want to, to look at, to work, to boost these things to projective modules, also introduce this uh, <coughs> conformal factor on the base. <coughs> and then, hopefully, we will have combination of two results, because Kahn and Moscovici have this formula, uh, <coughs> analog of Poly Polyakov's uh, anomaly formula, but that's conformal anomaly. This is holomorphic anomaly. And Bost has, uh, Jean Benoit Bost has a paper which composes, composes two things together, conformal anomaly and holomorphic anomaly. I'm going, I'm, 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 I'm going to go in that direction for the moment. So, well, uh, near future, very, very near future. So, so just don't, don't, uh, don't invest any time on that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully sooner. No, no, sooner. <laughs> it's tomorrow. It's <laughs> tomorrow.